What's better than a stroke small block Chevy? How about one with a supercharger? Today on Engine Power, the Chevy gets a big blower and major gains in the dyno cell. Plus, our junkyard engine gives us a sense of accomplishment when it actually runs. Welcome to Engine Power. Today we have two cool projects to tackle. Now the first one has been around for quite some time. It was repurposed and slightly wounded at the same time. Now anything that gets wounded can almost always be fixed to a certain extent. Now the second one is an engine that has a lot of heritage. It's new to us, but it's old, it's nasty, and that's exactly how we're gonna address it in a little bit. Mike mentioned a familiar engine that has been repurposed but slightly wounded. It is our 383 small block Chevy we called Project ReRev 2.0. Now this has been our test mule and our tech engine for changing cylinder heads, camshaft swaps, a plethora of intake manifolds, nitrous, and even a big blower. Now at some point we think we heard it a little bit running it on nitrous and that problem did not show up until we started making holes with the blower installed. What was that? Well, that sucked. What happened there was the cause of a hurt piston along the actual ring land. The boost from the supercharger pressurized the crankcase, forcing oil out of the front crankshaft seal, causing a big mess. Now, the easiest solution here is just to refresh the engine. With our block almost set up and our Sunnen SV15, it's time to do some work. Now, this is Sunnen's latest and greatest hone for doing engine blocks. It can handle cylinders as small as three quarters of an inch all the way up to eight inches, and it will do cylinder lengths up to 11 inches with special tooling. With a three horsepower spindle rating and a spindle speed range from 90 to 350 RPM, this hone can hold tolerances within 10 thousandths of an inch in both concentricity and straightness. You may notice the shiny new ICT billet torque plate. It was easily sourced from Summit Racing. It's machined out of tough aerospace grade billet aluminum. You can order them for several different bore sizes, and this one is for small block Chevys, and it comes in at one inch, 975 thousandths thick. It is needed to properly hone the cylinders. When torqued to the block's deck, it simulates bore distortion, just like when a head is torqued down, giving the engine better ring seal, reduced oil consumption, and higher compression. Now, keep in mind, this is a touch-up. We have new pistons, and they will be a little bit larger on clearance than uh, you would have if it were just a fresh bore and a fresh piston. Um, the old adage in racing is, if it's a little bit loose, no one's gonna know. If it's a little bit tight, everyone's gonna know. So this bore might be a thou, thou and a half bigger than uh, the minimum spec, but it's gonna run just fine. The final bore size is 4043. A 41 degree crosshatch was introduced to promote good ring break in. The crankshaft is a forged 4340 unit from Eagle. We ordered new pistons that were 26 grams lighter, so the crankshaft had to be sent out and rebalanced. It went to our favorite little machine shop in Nashville, Tennessee, Shacklet's Auto Machine. They did a great job adjusting the weight, and it shows their attention to detail. We're giving it a professional polish job using our Goodson crank polisher. A few rotations on each journal with a 600 grit belt will set the stage to finish it off with a cork line belt which will micro polish it to a mirror like finish. We jumped ahead and got the short block together. Now it included the original Eagle crank and rods and new Mala power pack pistons specifically for blower applications. Now they are 4032 alloy with a 16cc dish and dual valve reliefs. They have a one millimeter, one millimeter, two millimeter ring pack for lower drag and better cylinder sealing. The valve train goes together next. Trend push rods, Summit 1.6 ratio roller rockers, and a stud girdle make it all up. Cold lash settings are 14 thousandths on the intake and 16 thousandths on the exhaust. When up to temperature, the lash will increase to 20 thousandths on the intake and 22 thousandths on the hot side. Before we drop on the intake, a quick look to make sure there are no gremlins inside the engine. No cloths, no screwdrivers, no anything in there but... Torque wrenches? <laughs> Lashing tools? Nope. It's 
So what I think what needs to happen then is let's turn the blower, you grab whatever you can on the front, and I'll grab the back, and then that way, yeah. you know what I mean? Oh, hell, I don't need that thing. Okay, there we go. Hoo-wee. Good hustle, my man. When the uh, blower pulley is bigger than the balancer and the blower up to the hat is bigger than the engine, mm -hmm. it's cool stuff. Up next, the supercharged small block earns its stripes. How do you keep from having to reset the lash on your hydraulic roller valve train? The answer in today's tech tip. Setting lash on a hydraulic roller valve train is actually pretty easy. With the lifters in place, the push rod ends lubed and dropped in, now we can place the rock arms for cylinder number one on the studs. Now rotate the engine until the exhaust rocker starts to move up as if it were opening the valve. Tighten the intake rocker's adjusting nut as you rotate the push rod in your fingers. When all the vertical slack between the push rod and the rock arm is taken out, you are at zero lash. Now tighten the nut one half turn past the zero lash setting. This will give you between three hundredths and six hundredths of an inch of preload to a typical hydraulic lifter. For the exhaust valve, rotate the engine until the intake valve starts to close. Repeat the same procedures as earlier and you've completed lash for cylinder number one. Only seven more to go. We are ready for round two here in the dyno room with our 383 blower engine. Now the only thing that really changed on this thing is the compression ratio. And just so you know, we're running distilled race gas that's 104 octane. And the compression ratio has changed because we changed the piston. It's down to 9.26 to 1, and that's a couple of points down from our naturally aspirated compression ratio. Now we've ran the engine, broken the rings, and there are no drips or leaks. So it's time to see what this thing will make take two. What's up, boys? Where'd you make a noise? Oh, man, we are just about ready to make a test hit here. We're, uh, now we've done a couple things to it. We've knocked a bunch of boost out of it, knocked a bunch of timing out of it, and we're just gonna see now where we're at. Uh, we're getting back to square one, basically. So. Awesome. All right. That's exciting right now. That is 585 horse at 6,500. And again, torque is going to be a little on the low side, 507, five, yeah, 507 at 5,400. That, that was with six pounds. That, that's with six, six pounds of boost. Not bad for a mudslinging big truck. No. <laughs> no <laughs> and, right? Yeah, well, here's the thing. I think we keep our ceiling on RPM at 6,500. Let's yeah. go ahead and start dumping some uh, timing into it. Yeah. And uh, I, I don't think we need to look for a level off. I think we do, let's set a goal at six, 10, 615. Yeah, I, if, if it, like, like, this, like this man said before, if it starts with a six, they're happy. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. So I, I'm going to go, uh, go sneak a couple degrees in it. We've advanced the timing from 22 degrees to 24 degrees. jump in timing and look what it did for, for torque. Jump 20 pounds of torque. Wow. Okay, we're at 606 horse now at 6,500. Little adjustments make all the difference. Yep. And Same boost, 6.1 pounds. Yep. The only thing we could probably do is uh, start the pull a little higher and turn the engine a tiny bit higher. 45 to 68. Well, we hit the six mark, right? Oh, yeah, no. Yeah, we're, we're in there like swimwear. We're, we're in there like <laughs> swimwear, like the man says. I think it gets more and more exciting every time you guys change just little things around. The numbers just go up and up. It's like you guys know what you're doing. Well, <laughs> first time. Let's, let's 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 not get too presumptuous. Yeah, wait wait until we're done with yeah, the we'll, dinosaur. Yeah, wait session. until it's done. And yeah. there's there's not parts all over the yeah. floor. No, it it can, it can stick a rod in a wall on this one. <laughs> all the faith, man. All the faith. Number look pretty good. Woo! <laughs> okay. I, <laughs> so it's, I made a 24 for torque, but and, and it made 626, but the it's still going up. How tough you feeling? You want to turn it? 65 to 85. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
<laughs> well, you know, uh, I don't see any problem with turning it, you know, you know, 72? 7,200, yeah. You, you want to go for, your you wanna, call. Hey, it's your call. We want to go for the glory run or what? Yeah, why not? See, that's why I, I like got, you guys. I got faith, man. <laughs> that, that's the old no guts, no glory. That's here. right. Exactly. All right, Dad, what are we going to do? Uh, 7,200. Yeah. What's the rev limiter set at? The rev limiter's at 7,000. <laughs> 630 at 6,900. Yeah. All right. That's perfect. And then torque at a, a 32. Yeah. 54. There you go. Uh, but at this boost level, dude, you guys are you guys are in there. Dude, I can't wait to get it in the truck and get it in the mud. And here's my grand vision: is you pull into the the center of the mud pit and you stop and just have everybody look at you. And when you yeah. hammer on that, and Everything the roof just, just straight up, and it's just all RPM and just wheel spinning, like, get out of the way. And then uh, the last question is, is, do you want it back when we're done? I mean, it's a sentimental you know, value to no. care, isn't it? No? Don't no, want it? No, <laughs> no. 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 I think we said no at the same time. Say, this, is like, this is like Wheel of Fortune. Once you buy a prize, it's yours to keep. So. All right, I think we'll do it justice. Yeah, we'll put it to good use. Up next, under all that grease and grime, there's a pretty neat engine somewhere. We're almost back to the shop from a quick trip southbound into Alabama. Now the reason we went is to pick up an old, dirty, grimy diamond in the rough. Now it's an engine that has a lot of history and a huge following with the Blue Oval crowd. Now this one happened to find its home between the frame rails of an old dump truck, so you know it was a workhorse. Now we retrieved this engine for a reason. Uh, a lot of you viewers wrote in and we actually listened. The request was to find a historic engine of unknown shape in a junkyard and to see if we could get it running. I think we can. I think we can do it. So what could it be? How about an old FE? But what one, Pat? This is a 390 inch. Now, the FE was also Ford's quintessential industrial engine, which came in sizes from 330 inch all the way up to 428. Now, this 390 was in a dump truck, right? So just like it is, we are gonna see what it takes to actually get it running on the dyno. Let's see if we can get a grab on her here. Slow. Yeah. Uh, the only really thing I'm nervous about is if something has inadvertently been dropped down a cylinder because obviously this thing's been sitting like this for years. Only one way to find out. The first thing we're going to do before we even get started is knock a few of the heavy chunks off this thing. It has been sitting for a very long time and it has had the valve covers off. And a bunch of critters have lived and died on this engine. Now we're not going to get crazy. We're not going to Pebble Beach with this thing. We're just trying to get it running. So I'm going to scrape around with a screwdriver and knock some of the stuff loose. And then we're going to vacuum it up with the shop vac. Thank you, sir. Getting stuff running like this reminds me of my youth. There's always a challenge to get one running that hadn't been running before. Half of those were froze up though, so you had to break them loose. This one's actually, I think, in okay shape. With a leaf. See a clogged green back, look at this. Oh boy. <laughs> oh yeah. Look at that, big old chunk. Well, we, we say we hadn't made it any worse, that's for sure. Mm -mm. And that's about as good as that thing's gonna get with, at this. We're gonna have to get in there and scrape a little bit more and pull some of this out. I'm surprised that didn't break off. Yeah. Well, it's, it's set inside, it's set outside. This will tell you something right here. One, obviously the engine's stuck. Two, if the timing chain's broke. Three, if we have any stuck valves. So just kind of look around. Yeah, go ahead. It actually turns over. Yeah. Relatively nice. I got valves going up and down. Yep. You, you just make sure. I got, I got compression coming out over here. That turns over. Look at that. Turning the engine over and looking at the valve heights, we notice that the exhaust valve on number two cylinder, when it's at top dead center, is lower than the others. 
This means the valve is a little sticky in the guide. These valves should be at the same height at this point. So what we're gonna do is see if we can make it come back up by tapping it with a hammer, specifically a dead blow mallet. Voila, unstuck. Hopefully when the engine runs and the valve stem is lubricated by oil, it will loosen up and work as it should. Obviously we have to run exhaust on this engine when it goes on the dyno, but there's a little problem. There's a bunch of broken off studs in the exhaust flange. So I'm gonna go ahead and show you a little procedure I like to use to get them out. Most of the time it works, but when it doesn't, you will have to drill them and put in a Healy coil. Let's see how it goes. It's not red and it's not blue. Green is the color we choose. Forney welders have tons of features, use high quality parts, and are tested to the most extreme conditions, period. It's a whole lot of machine at a sweet price point. We're spraying some of Seafoam's Deep Creek penetrating oil onto the stud to see if we can get some of it to wick down into the threads. When this method works, it saves a lot of time. Unfortunately, the studs in this 390 did not want to be bothered. Since we're not reusing the heads, we're going to drill them out and use nuts and bolts to secure the headers. With a pilot hole drilled, Matco's hyperstep drill bits enlarge the hole in no time. They have a stepped end similar to a unibit. They make their own pilot and cut like a dream. There's TDC right there. A piece of Scotch-Brite exposes the timing marks after all these years. Goodson carbide scrapers are a must for any toolbox. If the surface is flat, they will remove anything in their way. Oh, look at that. I bet you that hasn't been off there for 35, 40 years. With enough cleaning and scraping, the original Ford Blue has resurfaced. Oh. At some point, this engine actually was blue. <laughs> we all want more power when it comes to our performance engines, but what about our tools? Like when you're using an impact and it just won't remove that stubborn bolt or nut, you need more power, and one of these will give it to you hands down. It's Matco Tools 20 volt Infinium half inch impact, and it has high performance in its genes. It uses brushless motor technology to produce 1,600 pound-feet of breakaway torque. It has four integrated LEDs to light up your workspace, a variable speed trigger that allows you to control power output, and is available in several different colors. Check them out and all the other cool stuff at matcotools.com. Up next, it smokes, but at least it fires. We're finally to a point where we can start putting parts on this, and they may look a little too shiny for this application, but here's what we're doing. They're all for the next phase of this build and exactly what we need to get this piece of junk running right now. So let's get started. First of all, we have to replace a bunch of fasteners that are missing from this engine. A quick trip to our ARP cabinet gives us a wide variety of high quality stainless fasteners to help get this rig going again. We're at the make a slight adjustment to this gasket. Extreme cases call for extreme measures. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna run sea foam through the engine and we're not doing it in a conventional way. We are not diluting it with any oil. We're gonna put a bunch in and then prime the engine while we're turning it over and see what comes out of the oil drain. That's why we're preparing for the apocalypse here. One of sea foam's benefits is its ability to clean deposits from the inside of an engine. That's exactly why we're using it. You can pour it directly into the crankcase or in your fuel system. Its job is the same, to clean deposits so your engine runs better. All right, $200 engine, 60 bucks of sea foam in it. Let's see what it does here. This leak is unwanted. 
but it does let us know the oil pump is doing its job by pumping the seafoam through the engine. Did seafoam do its job? It certainly did. It went in clear and came out black after just a couple minutes of priming. We'll flush the engine again using conventional oil and priming it the same way. Fuel. Here comes fuel. Ignition. No leaks. No leaks. Oh my god, I'm excited. Yeah! <laughs> Our goal was to get it running, and we succeeded. <laughs> For more information on anything you've seen on engine power today, log on to PowerNationTV.com.